you could note attendance for meeting minutes. And we have open forum. Is there anybody that wishes to speak in open forum tonight? Okay. Empty open forum. We will move right into the discussion portion of our agenda. So a reminder for anybody who happens to be watching online, tonight is a workshop and not a me formal meeting. Um, you will notice a couple of differences in structure. We will not take any official action tonight. Tonight is an opportunity for staff and council to evaluate a number of topics. Anything that is discussed tonight that would require official action will take place on a regularly scheduled meeting. And with that, let's open up our agenda with our first item, which is initial to lead us through this? Yes, I am. Thank you. Um, I pr provided a memo regarding some of the first priorities that I've seen uh, since uh, becoming the city administrator. And I'd like to uh, go over those now. And again, these are just a few of the things that I'm sure we'll get to as the months and years go by. But uh, first blush, these are, these are the items I think are important enough to address right now. So I'll go through these one, and one, at, one at a time, and um, <clears throat> you can uh, interrupt maybe any time you want to, questions and uh, discussion. Uh, the first priority that I believe is uh, the most important out of all of these on this uh, memo is to uh, recruit and hire a finance director, an internal finance director. Currently, uh, we have a contractual finance, finance uh, company AEM that provides our accounting finance services uh, and things like that. Um, one of the things when I, f shortly after I came here, I asked uh, the department heads what the priorities would be for the city as a whole. And everyone responded that we need a finance director internally. Um, we need somebody in the office who can guide our finances, be here every day, uh, answer questions, uh, do some long-term financial planning, um, and not to say that the current contractual system isn't performing as well as they can, but they're only performing as well as they can. Um, I know that's, that's kind of a circle, but uh, we do really need somebody here every day. We need somebody to be able to, to look at the budgeting, look at reporting, uh, and take some of the pressure off the, the remaining staff, financial staff, who We've been running into a number of hours of overtime uh, and a number of uh, questions that remain unanswered until a Tuesday or a Wednesday, depending on what day that, you know, we have our people come in. So I think it's important. Uh, some of the other priorities that I've listed will, uh, will necessitate a position like that being in place so that those can be successful as well. Um, we have provided to you uh, some background information on a comparison to the contract cost evaluation. Uh, and just want to comment um, in that memo, we, we you know, pegged it last time the finance director to grade 18 uh, with a salary of 91,000 to 114,000. Well, as you can tell by uh, the area uh, survey that those, those salaries have gone up now. Um, you know, for example, White Bear Lake we're looking at 94 to $131,000 range, uh, and so forth and so on. So wh what I would ask is that you uh, <coughs> approve us to begin the recruitment and uh, job description process, um, allow us to uh, advertise for the position. We'll need to come back and set the salary range very quickly, um, but I think we can do that. Based on this survey, it's pretty apparent what we where we should be and what we should be doing. So I think that's the most important uh, priority that I've seen so far. Um, if I get nothing else tonight, that would be what I would, I would ask you for. <laughs> um, the second uh, priority that I see, uh, again... Uh, Can we go through this one by one? Can sure. we pause in any conversation questions related specifically to the finance director? I guess I have one question. Did we have a, did we at one time have a finance director? In My understanding that we did about, what, four years ago, possibly? Yeah, three, yeah. three, three years, years ago. ago. And did we move to a contract thinking it would be a cost savings? Do you know? I, I can't, I'm not sure why they moved to it. I believe they probably thought it was a cost savings and maybe it might look like a cost savings, but if you look not at the much. overtime we're incurring, yeah. And you look at and the water rate study that you, that the, the council went through, that should have been able to be done in house instead mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. having 
you know, have put that outside and have spent seven thousand dollars for a water uh, rate study that easily could have probably been done in internally, mm -hmm. and actually should be looked at on an annual basis. And a good finance director will look at when preparing a budget as a why, you know, the revenues and expenditures in the in the process and what the rates are doing, and, and make annual adjustments instead of every five years or twelve years or whatever the case may be. So. Madam Mayor, uh, this has been brought up several times, and especially in the last couple of years, and with not much success. But uh, I can remember when we had a finance director here; uh, she was here at every single meeting, and uh, I didn't serve on the council at that time, but I was serving on a couple of committees. And she had an open door policy; it was very easy to get information, and she could under you know for people like me that needed to understand things. And and the fact that she was here to to explain uh, different parts of that whole job uh, day in and day out was was amazing. And it turns out that uh, I think we can hire a finance director for not much more money than what we're paying now. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're only, and the person's only here one day a week. And uh, I believe that there's also some savings uh, with the uh, overtime that's being paid now toward mm -hmm. a couple of the people in the office that are working a lot of overtime. And a lot of that could be uh, uh, Remedied by having a new finance director, and I, I got quite frankly, I was sorry to see uh, see her leave when she did, and uh, I never agreed with it, even though I had nothing to say about it. I cert certainly did not agree with it. So, anyways, that's all I have to say. Do anything? Well, I I just um, when I happened to be at a meeting as a non-council member and um, learned about the, the rate increase, the water rate increase that had um, been missed at some point down the road. Um, and then learned after the fact that um, all of our finance services were contracted out. Um, it just, it didn't, it really didn't make sense to me at all. Um, and then, uh, getting the cost benefit analysis from you, Patrick, it really doesn't make sense to me now mm -hmm. um, to have somebody in house one day a week in a growing city like we are. So um, I just think this appears to be a real value add um, to operations for us. Um, I think it provides us an opportunity for more direct control, um, some um, improvements in kind of our daily um, kind of daily workflow, uh, timeliness of getting uh, numbers, you know, out to city staff. Um, uh, uh, quality control, accountability, and transparency also come to mind for me. Um, and and again, that faster turnaround and ability to kind of catch these errors that we've yeah. we've missed along the way. Um, and then I think uh, the ability to unearth other efficiencies, which I'm not sure somebody who's has you know this com competitive. Uh, competitive clientele has an opportunity to really do. Yeah. So I think it's a win-win. Mm -hmm. When I, oh, I was just going to say, I think if that was what your department heads listed as the number one priority, that eases some frustration on their part too. Yeah, I think so. I think that's absolutely correct. I think there's been times that the departments can't get the information that they may need on a timely basis. And again, it's not because of uh, non-performance by the contractual uh, company, but just the arrangement that we have. Uh, the other thing with the contractual that I didn't mention is um, they assign a fairly young and new finance person to this, which isn't a bad thing. But what that will end up experiencing, usually as most young professionals want to do, they want to move up the ladder. So you will be probably changing that person out every two years or every three years. And so the history and the, the institutional knowledge will go with that person, even though that there's a backup staff in, in the firm, it's really being on the ground out day-to-day -day stuff that, that'll be lost every two to three years as somebody progresses through their career. Quick point of clarification that I had. So our contractual arrangement with our current provider, is it really just one day a week on site? Yes. Is there a, is there a numbers as part of that? And in, in I guess what I'm getting at, is there an hours requirement as part of that? Yeah. So I, are we really going from eight hours of capacity to eight to 10 hours of capacity to now 40 to 45 hours of capacity? 
for roughly the same well, rate. Is that a fair comparison? The, it, it's a difficult comparison, but um, I haven't, don't remember what the contract said, but uh, it's been the experiences I've been here and I believe what the department has have told me that we do have one person here one day a week. Okay. Now, that doesn't mean that email and phone calls won't be answered, which they are, but that's still a lot different because that, that is obviously not that person's only duties at the firm. So, uh, for and not to bash them, but our current direct finance person is won't be back into the office until the 29th. She has a vacation. That's great, but we have to pause again. So, and it's not that we won't have a finance director go on vacation, but you know we'll have some institutional knowledge. We'll have you know people who hopefully are in charge with knowing some of those small things when they go, even a three-week period. Um, so it really is. It really is more of an expansion of what we can get done, focus on what we need to do, uh, look at our whole financial picture uh, with somebody who's experienced and then uh, knows the flavor of the council, knows the flavor of the management, and what we are really looking to accomplish. Mark, one, one more thing. I just have some questions. Patrick, could you tell us <coughs> what that contract amount is each in annually? Uh, I believe it's... Was it Dan? One hundred twenty thousand. Uh, no one second here. I see here. Uh, one hundred and thirty-three thousand two hundred. Yeah. See, the, the thing of it is, I mean, that seems to me like a no-win or a, a no-lose situation. <coughs> what I meant to say, it's a win-win situation because yeah. of the salary that's paid. And I just wanted to bring that up to the public. Uh, and uh, it seems to me it's a dollar-for-dollar dollar trade. Yeah, actually, it's one hundred eighteen eight hundred, and then we pay other. That first, first figure I gave you was plus other things that we can contract out right. for. So. Yeah. There will be a benefit load on top of that, but again, I still agree with previous comments. That well, you'll also have another professional in the building that can supervise front staff that can uh, take over in absences of different places so that, uh, you know, are the responsible senior official that's not, uh, that is a little more broad <coughs> in scope than uh, maybe the public works or police or things like that, so. Minor Nick comment on my part um, in the future when we're doing comparisons to cities, can we um, pull in our the traditional benchmark cities? And we don't always have that data available, but I like to use a consistent benchmark group whenever we can because it prevents us from cherry picking the ones we like and don't like. <coughs> always happy to entertain outliers, um, and some of those are on this sheet. But and then if we need to have a conversation about new benchmark cities, let's do that. I think that maybe hasn't been reevaluated yeah. in a couple that's, of years. So that's fine. This sheet was just directly from the uh, League of Cities, no editing or anything. Perfect. This is what they gave us. So. Yeah, I, I just had a couple questions, Patrick, as I was reading through this. Um, uh, one of the things that jumped out to me is it appears the market demand for finance directors is pretty high. Yes, it is. Um, and the availability of qualified individuals is low. How how do we how do we overcome that? I guess that's kind of one part of that question. And um, is is the director position necessary? Is there a manager or supervisor? I, I'm uh, assuming title equates to pay grade, um, but I'm just kind of wondering about skill set relative to, you know, title relative to need. Yeah, to answer, yes, the, the finance market is tight. There are a lot of, uh, it, the economy is really good. Um, jobs are plentiful. Private sector is pulling away people that for similar types of jobs. Uh, I've talked to Stillwater recently and they, how they went through their process. Um, we will have to recruit heavily, look very carefully and be very selective as much as possible. I mean, it's just really more than art form to try to, and, and I, uh, I have never been one that says, okay, we've got a bunch of resumes, we do some initial interviews and we don't have anybody that we like, we should hire anybody just, well, no, we'll, we'll start over if we have to. I just won't hire somebody to hire somebody. That just is not a, you always end up losing on the, on, on the other side of that anyway. So we will look for the most qualified candidate, even if it takes us two or even three tries. But uh, fortunately, we do have the contractual uh, a firm that we can continue on until we, we find the right person for the position. Um, as far as title or, or responsibilities go, uh, I think that uh, once we spell out those, those responsibilities, it'll be similar to the list that you see in front of you from the other communities. Um, you know, doing the, the finance investments, 
uh, working with Ellers for bond sales, doing budget, doing the, helping the auditors, supervising staff. And, and the other caveats here, uh, as I later will talk, to, talk about, is uh, water billing, water utility rates, uh, the water uh, sy billing system, uh, and possible software system. So that will also be on the top of their duties when we get there to help implement those. I mean, when you do, if we do a software conversion, you have to look at the chart of accounts, you have to look at the structures, you have to look at the processes and try to streamline them as much as possible. Uh, one of the goals of software, and I'll get to this in a minute, is to streamline your processes so you may not be able to cut staff, but you don't have to add staff. As the burden continues, as we grow and grow and grow, if we can't streamline it and make it uh, paperless and routing through electronic means, we don't have to often um, have more people to do that, so. Um, and then one other, if it's all right with you. Um, um, there was a, uh, it appears some of that benefit and ins insurance work uh, would be brought back in house and yes. probably assigned to Brenda. I mean, well, does, I, does she have some, does she have that capacity? I, I think a finance, a good finance director will, should be able to understand uh, the cost benefit of health insurance and okay. life insurance and uh, liability insurance and uh, all of that coverage, okay. the insurance will be dropped into the finance director's duties. Okay. And it's not, like I said, it's all insurance. So though, a good finance director, and I've had the pleasure of working with many, should be able to understand that, know that market, and if not, get trained on it. Um, I intend to work really closely with the finance director because more of my background is on finance and, and, and budgeting and, and I've done all of those types of things for the most part. Uh, so I will know what, where they're weak, where they're strong, what, and we'll focus on getting them up to speed. But yes, I, I, I believe that we can probably handle health insurance rates and health insurance recruitment on our own. Uh, that's not that difficult. We can handle getting ready for the CAFR or the financial report, I should say. Um, getting ready for bonding sales and working with Ellers and getting that information, doing water rate studies, doing the sewer rate studies. Um, those are things that we should be able, a good finance director should be able to do, you know, fairly easily and fairly straightforward. It's just a, a really an analysis on fund balance and cash flow and things that are pretty normal for that position. Okay, okay great. Thank you. <clears throat> Anything else related to the finance director position? <clears throat> Okay, moving on, utility billing. Utility billing. Um, of the phone calls I've gotten so far in my, in my tenure, which there's been a few, um, many, many of them have been, and probably the most recurring theme is why my water bill is so messed up and why I can't get a refund and why I can't do this. And, um, I believe that our water billing system, all, which is also contractually, um, performed uh, needs, to be ref needs to be reformed. We need to uh, take control of that and bring that back in house as well. Uh, these days, um, uh, software and electronics and elect electronic billing, electronic payments make this much simpler uh, than when I first got into government, well, however long ago, and this was my first job was utility, was a collection office, was the collection of fees and fines for a municipality. Um, we should be able to have a utility bill, billing system that's accurate, uh, that reflects um, up-to-date information, that get bill, gets bills out on a regular basis, that pays the bills and records the bills correctly without mistake. I mean, obviously there's going to be one or two, everybody happens, but I think the level of error in our utility billing system is way too high. And I don't have empirical data for that, but just from, uh, like I said, phone calls and, and other kinds of things. Um, I also think that we need to, as, as mentioned in the, the memo, is look at possibly changing that billing cycle. Everybody here gets their gas bills monthly, gets their electric bills monthly, get their cell phones. Why aren't we doing water and sewer monthly if, or even bi-monthly if that's the case? Um, you do that monthly or bi-monthly, it increases your cash flow, increases your earnings on investments. Um, but however, what I'm really striving for is, is a system that is correct. That's a very simple ask. I'm asking that it's correct, that it's handled correct, that we handle customers with uh, our citizens well, politely, and 
fix their problems. If they, now, um, this is tied into the enterprise software uh, purchase. This is also tied into um, the water meter reading system that we approved in the budget in the capital plan. It's kind of a triangle of things that we need to accomplish. Uh, sure, we, if we put in a real, all these new meters, which we will, that can be read automatically, but we don't have a software or a company that can handle those readings on a regular basis, why even bother? You know, I mean, obviously, we want uh, up-to-date information. With a new reading system, uh, you move out of your house, you call us up, we punch a button, we get your reading, you're done. We bill you right away. Come in today to pay it. So when the title company asks for the final bill, you should be able to have it. If we don't have a software platform or a company even to support that, again, it's, it's not going to be any good. Um, in order to do that, in order to take advantage of the new meters that we're going to put in and the reading system we're going to put in, we need software to do that. The current software doesn't handle that well. Uh, it probably can handle it, but there's a lot of interfaces and things that probably aren't, aren't doing very well. We've identified a company that we're interested in that already handles the, the system that we're looking at. Uh, and I have experience with in my past that I think will make a world of difference in, in billing without having to add staff. We should, be, again, electronic payments, you know, go online, pay your bill. Uh, that's how it goes. And then we can still take anything that comes in the mail. If we get swamped in the mail event because we can't get people to change over, we can always look at a lockbox system where a bank handles that and does that processing if we get swamped internally. But water bills will come back with barcodes on them. You bing the barcode and you're done. I mean, it sounds a little simpler than I, it really is, obviously, but uh, I think it's important to get this water billing system uh, up to date, uh, have it working correctly, uh, marginalize the errors, and make our, our citizens uh, comfortable with their getting a water bill on a regular basis at the same time every month or every other month or every three months and know that they can trust what they get. Right now, adjustments and all those things, there's no rhyme or reason. It's, there's a lot of issues there. So I know that's been hiding under the covers probably for a while, but uh, it seems to be there, and I think it needs to be changed. Questions on items? Just yeah, discussed? I guess the next question is the cost for the software, and have you explored any of that? Well, um, just to get it out here. So you know. To, well, I'll get in, I'll get into software here just a little bit then, um, which okay. is the next one. But um, you know, last budget, this current budget year, you've identified funds for software for the building department to do um, uh, permits and hopefully some field inspection. Um, you the budget of about thirty thousand dollars. You're not going to get anything for thirty thousand dollars that can do that. Just that's flat out. If you do, it's not going to be worth it. In a year from now, you'll be coming back. Uh, what I would, what I'm proposing on the <coughs> software is to uh, spend the money where you have an, an enterprise system that, from one company that does it all as much as possible in municipal, the municipal world. They do all the finance, payroll, HR, budgeting, uh, accounts payable, accounts receivable. They do building permitting. They do field inspections, so the inspector's out in the field and can do it on a, a tablet. Um, they do water billing, utility billing, sewer, water, garbage if you had it, whatever you can come up with. They do business licensing and a whole host of other items that a municipality can't uses on a regular basis. So instead of throwing, I don't know, Chad, what was it, 80000 to $200,000 or something like that for probably for, for some of the other ones about two, instead of throwing that kind of money at a single platform that just does one thing, and you can go out and find a utility billing software, and it'll probably cost you, you know, a medium range, 50, 60, 70,000 dollars, who knows. Buy one piece of software, one, one business model that says, okay, it, across, it, they all communicate, they all work together. You know, when you pay a water bill, it not only hits the water, you, you know, the, your account, but it also hits the general ledger. And you're not doing any of those kind of transactions. You're not having to do some of those things. Obviously, there's still some of that, but not as much. So um, 
yeah, for a new water system now to get the data, the data from the, um, the current company in our contract, we'd have to pay $4,000 for the data. One of the things I've been made aware of is we're not sure how good that data is. We may have to start to build this, the data from scratch, depending on how bad or how corrupt or how inaccurate that data is. And that we can't do until we test it and take a look at it. Um, that's, what, that's the other thing we're afraid of with water utility billing is, you know, there's been so many different variations on how things are put in. So, for example, uh, when we, a new piece of software for either building or water utility, for example, uh, if you have um, Main Street, uh, some people may put it in Main, that's it, Main ST, Main S-T-R-E-E-T, -E uh, and each of those can be, depending on the software, considered a separate address. So you have to have a common address system. Uh, software systems now take care of some of that, that they, they do error checking, and that's part of the implementation. So uh, we have to be careful with that. So to answer your question, it's gonna cost, I am proposing that you reserve or take from the, the conduit financing uh, $300,000 for a new piece of enterprise software that will replace most of the internal working software that this, the city has right now. And we'll probably take a year to two years to implement that based on getting the right staff in place, getting the knowledge in place, and things like that. But some of these modules that we're talking about, we can start with the building software, and, and that can stand on its own for a while until we integrate the general ledger or, or wherever we need to do. We can have utility billing stand on its own until we, again, put the other pieces in place, and then they'll, they, they will integrate seamlessly. As part of the water CIP, we had a amount reserved for software, I think, two years from now. Is that, am I recalling I that think, correctly? I don't, I don't know a, that. Don't I had $200,000 in I believe that's mine. plugged in there, yeah. It, and so, is the thought that's not that's no longer needed with an enterprise solution? Obviously, the water fund's not going to pay for all of that. No, but if, if you have two hundred thousand dollars in the water fund two years from now, that's almost you know you're two thirds of the way there. You need and and, and when I say three hundred thousand, that's not just the software. And, and that's implementation. That's uh, uh, putting um, converting the data, ten years of data basically, and having it all set and ready to go. Turn the switch on, training everything. The water fund obviously can only pay for the water portion of that, but um, just being clear on sources of funds, I think there was some amount that was earmarked a couple of years from now. Um, um, layers of the onion, right? You're, there's, sure. a, there's, a, there's a lot here. Yeah, there is. But I'm understanding you, first step is finance director. Um, and with that finance director in place and with those skills, then software evaluation, preparing for that project. Um, was that how you would sequence? Or? I would sequence it, uh, a finance director, concurrently um, signing a contract with a software vendor and then figure out the implementation because we've looked at uh, two vendors now. Uh, we know the vendors in the field. I know the vendors in the field. I went through a software conversion three years ago. Um, I know how much it costs and what it'll take, uh, but I would say uh, we would sign a contract, figure out what the payment and implementation is because it may not need to happen all at once, but then pursue the building department, building permitting and field inspections right away as well. I think that's important for to improve our, our permitting uh, software, the ability for online scheduling of inspections, uh, the receding of those inspections and making it easier for the inspectors out in the field to enter their inspections out on site. And then just they basically they come back and to whatever Wi-Fi site is and it uploads to the, to the software. So that's what I would do. I would, I would do both of those this year. Uh, I would come back to you as soon as possible with the software and as soon as possible with the finance director. Okay, thank you. And we're, as it relates to software, we're able to implement one module first, first being building, then evaluate what's next likely. It sounds like that might be utility yeah. building. Yeah, depending on utility. And that really depends and on the, on the meter installation and, and how what we have to do with the data. 
we'll have to have we will have to have some uh, long conversations with the software vendor to figure out what the implementation. But I I know that we can do the building module freestanding. We can do utility billing freestanding. Um, really, then the finance stuff comes later. And and for for the short term, you take revenues in the building department or revenues in the utility building. Basically, it's a it's a journal entry into the system that you know you create out of one and just manually enter it into the other. So but that's that's nothing. It's really getting to the point where we really want to start to streamline the operations. I mean, if you want, we have a lean staff. There's no doubt this staff is probably one of the leanest I've ever seen, and it's okay. But in order to not blow up as you grow and as demand happens. You need to give us the tools to try to help slow some of that down. Not that it will slow it down forever, but right now we need to slow it, see what we can do to keep that uh, lean staff here. Go ahead. Um, yeah, the current system seems incredibly inefficient. Um, I'm just wondering, is there a way to do some sort of comparative analysis kind of of our current state? how this work is being done cost-wise, and I mean, it, it seems on paper um, ob kind of obvious, mm -hmm. but I'm just wondering if there's a way to, to, a way to lay that out. So, I mean, obviously there's gonna be some long-term, I would say long, this, this, this uh, in my opinion, these are the, the kind of investments we should be making mm -hmm. because they're going to increase efficiencies for us um, mm -hmm. and, op and a lot of opportunities beyond those increased efficiencies. Um, it just would be nice to see some comparative analysis if that can be done. I'm not sure it can be, but um, yeah, I'm trying to think off the top of my head how that would be done be based done. on the current system and how we would tell you what it's kind of fragmented study on the man hours and and uh, what it takes to do. Um, yeah, yeah. I, let me think about that a little okay. bit. I'm not sure that's going to be possible, but okay. we'll, we'll we'll think about okay. that one. I, I could maybe just add one little on that point of clarification. So currently, with our current kind of fragmented system to do any linking of modules or any type of work. It's a lot of custom coding through our laser freeze module. So each time we try to bridge, say, like a Springbrook check scan with a, with a lookup through laser feast, we have to do custom coding. Each one of those is approximately $5,000 to have them fully develop that out. Anytime we try to do like a, like on the permitting side to do an in-house permitting solution for building that would allow for a resident to custom, you know, to enter in that data through a web portal, you're looking at probably a $30,000 build okay. in our current system. But what happens is that if, say, Springbrook upgrades to version 2.0 or in version 1.0, we have to go back and rebridge everything that we made because all the lookups will change. So we almost have to go back when we do an upgrade to one piece of the software. Now, that's any piece of the software upgrades. We have to go back in and get the coders back in here to do all that custom coding. So there's a lot more management of the system versus if you do enterprise, it's all you call up the enterprise solution, they do all that integration there, it comes back out, it works. So we've done a little bit of work, or I've done a little bit of work trying to link some of these things together and it becomes a very, it's a lot, it's a time consuming process to try to get everything bridged. There's a lot of work on, with outside vendors and our IT department who's not here every single day to do the work. And what's happening is, I'm getting to the point where I start bringing more and more stuff to Laserfish. They're not staffed accordingly to allow me to go say, I need this module, this module, and this module and they see how yeah, we can do it, well then, just to do a year switch over, it can take longer just because of the fact they don't have a dedicated person to work for Forest Lake on our changeovers. So some of this custom coding, it works great for a while, but then when it starts to age out a little bit, a lot more work on the back end just to keep it up, up and running. Very helpful. Thanks, Nia. Um, just one other quick question. What percent of our folks pay online? And would this improve that? I, oh, it should. It definitely should. Um, I, again, I don't know that for to be sure. Um, the the vendor that we're looking at, even even though we haven't awarded it, uh, has a real slick interface that allows people to go online and, and pay it. We would uh, really hit once this is all up and running. We would hit the customer hard to try to get them to pay online. I mean, it, it would be in our best interest to advertise. Even sometimes I've seen where you offer a discount for the first year if you pay online. You know, pay your bill, you save 10%. Anything to, to switch people over to, and that's happening anyways, obviously, but um, uh, I don't know how many, uh, because we, we don't, um, I haven't seen a report, I haven't asked Becky, but because that's outside of the building and outside of process, 
I have no idea how big the stack of envelopes are that come into that office or how much comes online. So right. I, I just can't answer that right now. I will look and see though and see if we can figure it out. I think um, as we are evaluating software and thinking about timing and what, that, what those conversions look like, those conversions, and Dan alluded to a little bit of this, can be incredibly challenging. Um, so making sure we've got the right staff prepared. And then also to transition residents. Um, if we've got some utility mess that is converting, let's be thoughtful on how that happens because what we don't want to do is make it even worse in the conversion if something is a little... So let's do a thorough evaluation of what does that data look like? How good is it? Um, and that requires some you know, detail and the right person to kind of lead that charge. Yeah, it, it's going to be important to look at the, in the, in the case of the water billing system, the, the, the data behind all of that and how that's going to convert and if we should convert. Um, yeah, we just don't, we don't want to make a mess and we could make a mess. And one of the things we will do, of course, when you do a conversion like this is you run parallel systems for one or two cycles on billing to make sure that when you do it, it all looks the same. And then sooner or later, you turn off the old system and continue on the new system. So we will do that before, um, and the vendor will be required to, to prove that out for us as well. So. Does the vendor provide assistance with the implementation? Because that's one of my other concerns. They do the it. entire implementation. Staff. Okay. They do training. They do the data conversion. They do everything. They come in and they train. They come in and uh, in the back of software these days, at least the software, some of the software we're looking, it's really just a series of switches in the background that you turn on and off depending on what your, how, your, how your operation runs. And uh, then uh, you can change at any time. It's, it, it is not reprogramming. It's a matter of giving permissions or turning a switch on or turning a switch off. And that's uh, the... The enterprise administrator who will be identified in-house will have the, 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 um, the capability of doing those changes if necessary. If not, they, you know, you go to their help desk or their help helpline and things like that to, to have them help you walk through that. Um, yeah, we will have a lot of implementation. We will have the vendor walk us through it. We will have them check the data. I mean, on-site training, it's, it's a big job. I'm sure there's going to be plenty of questions between now and then. Oh, yeah. So, Any other questions of, at this point, it's in concept, a potential project for 2019? Anything else? Okay. okay. So I, I, that was water billing and the enterprise software system. A um, couple more things. Hopefully I'll go through. Uh, the building and planning. Um, building and planning and... Uh, economic development, in my mind, are pretty interrelated. They need to be on the same page. They need to work w well together. Um, I think that right now uh, they're kind of fractured on how they're administered, and, and that's no fault of who's doing it. It's just I don't, I don't understand why a fire chief is running the building department, but that's me. Um, and he's done a great job, as far as I can tell. Um, but I would like to try, at least on a trial basis, to reassign the duties of... of the, both the building into planning and economic development. Um, some of this also uh, goes along with software implementation where uh, not only is the, the software that we're talking about doing for building and inspections and permitting, it also has a planning function that tracks planning and meetings and zoning requests and variances and all of that thing as, as far as workflow goes. Uh, so I would like to recommend um, right now, at least for our trial basis, that uh, the assistant to the city administrator assume those division that was supervision duties uh, to see how we can take a closer look and how we can uh, have some better performance uh, again streamline coordinate them uh, and make them work at the best possibility um, we'd have to come back again obviously to determine um, any adjustments in pay or anything like that but I think right now uh, it's a wise idea to try to coordinate those a little closer um, especially the planning and the building, and then um, also uh, get the planning and building departments to uh, coordinate closer with the public works department. So I think that's all, and the engineer, I think that's all important to, I think we're missing some of those steps, not that we're being a detriment, I just think we need to fill some of those gaps in, and I think right now I'd like to see if this is the way to do it. 
you know, I don't want to uh, recommend another, you know, person come in and create a community development person right now or anything like that. Uh, I want to see how this one goes and see if this is the solution that we can we can use to to have these better performances uh, in these two divisions. Thoughts or questions from council? Uh, just one comment, if yeah, you don't mind. I, I work with the building department occasionally, you know, and uh, I got to will say that uh, there's been a vast improvement over the last few months. So uh, kudos to the guys that work in the building department and to Al and all that. So. But uh, you know, let, let's we don't want to put all the pressure on one or two people. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So I think what you're doing is is right. So the only comment I have. Thank you. And if it doesn't work and I screw it up, I'll come back and say <laughs> I screwed it up. So. so you're proposing giving this a try, and then yes. we'll just kind of reevaluate. Yes, I need I, I need to see how this works okay. and if it's the right fit and if it's the right structure and see where it goes. I mean. Okay. We have a lot of moving parts right now. We will have a lot of moving parts for the next year or so, probably even two with all of what I'm suggesting. But uh, yeah, let's let's see how it works. Okay. Just a comment. Um, you know, I ran on efficient and effective government, so I appreciate I appreciated the memo and you taking a look at this. Um, I think sometimes it does take somebody coming in with fresh eyes to look at that and see new things, and not that it's um, you know those who have been here some historical knowledge, you know, not that they couldn't do it, but sometimes you just get stuck in how you've always done things. So I just appreciate you looking at these things and um, just knowing in my own um, day job that sometimes the streamlining and efficient and effective, is, there is a little bit of an upfront cost, but there is cost savings down the way, so. Yeah, and I think the cost savings isn't so much on on reducing staff or anything. I think it's just not increasing because, you right. know, as you're growing every day, you know, 20 years from now, who knows how big you'll be and what you'll need. But um, if we can, you know, slow that down a little bit and not have to add too much staff or, or add the staff at the right places, like the finance director, where he really is a, a, a real true cog in the wheel that needs to be fixed, do that. So, yeah, you're right. It's, it's down the line that we're looking here. Mm -hmm. Well, and it sounds like it'll be better for the end user. We were personally one of those so. people with the water utility building issues, so well, thank not, you. <laughs> I'm not surprised, so. No. I um, like in concept, um, economic development um, moving underneath kind of the same umbrella as building and planning. I think those, if we're doing it right, those people should be at the same table anyway, so there's some nice efficiency there. Um, I would just offer up, um, you know, as, the, as East, positions start to get solidified, and as you start to evaluate ranges in scale, um, let's use personnel committee as needed to make those adjustments to get people slotted where they need to be based on the role. So. Yeah, we will be doing the slotting work after tonight and seeing where we think everything should land and, and presenting that as we go forward. Perfect. Good. Yeah, I'll be anxious for an update on, you know, kind of the upwork, operations and workflow improvements as well. It'll be interesting to see how your little experiment goes. I, I am too. Yeah. I am too. And you know, again, not to to kill software, but the software we're looking at has got electronic workflow that just <clears throat> it's 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 a wonderful yeah. thing. So Great. doesn't fix everything, but it, it's nice to have. So public works. A um, couple of things in public works. One, I have to compliment the um, superintendent who uh, I've known a few superintendents and a few public works people in my career, and he. Uh, he uh, Dave really knows what he's doing and, and is a value to the to the city and uh, we need to consider um, making that a true department head level. Uh, we need to uh, reevaluate the position, reevaluate the the salary uh, and and so forth. Uh, again, another as we grow, we're going to need more and more and more. Uh, but uh, from what I've seen, uh, Dave's good with the citizens, he's good with the staff, he's good with his job. He understands the role and the direction and seems to have the public works on the right track, as far as I can tell. So um, I think in the long term we need to, to look at appointing the, the current superintendent to the position of the public works director. Uh, Dave and I will have to have some discussions on the process and timetable on that, but I think that's something we need to move forward on. And again, we'll have to look at how that's slotted and, and when we do that. Uh, secondly, uh, Dave and I have been talking about uh, 
underneath the uh, direction underneath his authority. Um, right now, we currently have a lead worker in the streets, I believe it is, and um, we need to, we want to reorganize that to um, create, uh, eliminate that lead position. Uh, not exact, not the body in it, but just the title, and uh, create um, two foreman positions uh, and increase their supervisory duties and their staff direction duties. So that when Dave, if he ever gets on a vacation or wants to go out of town or gets busy, or uh, there's a couple people back at the shop that can still direct operations and still direct uh, the day-to-day -day things, uh, do some supervisory reviews. Uh, those would still be union positions. We would not be adding any positions at all. We would just be reclassifying a couple workers. Uh, we would do internal interviews and see if we believe there's people who would apply for that and be qualified to be the foremans. Uh, I believe one is on the utility side and one is on the street side, streets and park side. Uh, uh, Dave agrees that this is, he's, it was his idea, this is the way we should be going, so that's what we're looking to do here. Uh, we have negotiations with the union coming up on Thursday, so we'll start to have talks with them. Uh, but I think, and, and Dave, you can chime in if you wish, that this is probably right now the best uh, step for the public works to, to go down so that we have some backup in, in management. Yeah, I agree. It, it it cleans up some language too. We have a streets lead, which um, you know, that working form would be streets and parks to kind of incorporate, you know, both positions and then utilities too, just to to incorporate because we have stormwater now that we kind of have shifted stormwater in into utilities now. So that's some cities keep it on the street side, but um, just with the expertise and the equipment that we use, cleaning ponds and cleaning pipe work and fixing that, it makes more sense to keep the guys who know how to run that equipment to add that on. So with that added on, that's you know, an important position as well. Plus you're not losing a body, you're keeping, I mean, they're, they can add direction, but you're not losing it to an administrative spot where you actually lose someone to do the work too. So I mean, they'll still be responsible to do all day-to-day -day activities, but just an increased role and in giving direction and day-to-day -day stuff. Is there a uh, does this restructure go as far as needing a new job description and a new pay rate, or is this? Yeah, we we actually have like? written a job description. We have that. Um, it, there will be some. I, we don't know what the pay rate will be yet. I don't know what it is. We we have to talk about that. We, we we've talked. We've been talking to our labor attorney to kind of figure out that structure. Some of that will come in negotiations, and I don't know the difference between a lead worker and a regular worker. If it's a dollar an hour or what the case may be, but we'll have to look at that real close, pretty soon here to determine. But. Uh, it's a minor adjustment, really, as far as having two foremans instead of one lead. We think it's an efficient adjustment, and we think it's something that, um, like I said, when, when Dave ever wants to take a vacation or we don't have to worry about him not being here or he gets hit by a bus, we still have people that can run the operation, at least for the short term. So, I hope I don't get hit by a bus. <laughs> we all do. Well, I, I'm hoping not either, but that's, I don't think it was a wish or anything. <laughs> Um, so I so agree with your comments and um, kudos, th thank you. Dave does provides tremendous service and is just incredibly well respected within our community. So um, also interesting enough, we although not official in that department head title is already part of the MAPE union, which is the union for department heads. That's correct, correct right? So yes. this really is um, some realignment within that contract, but there is our, we already have that contractual relationship. Um, so I would like to see that um, language be worked out, and that's all part of that MAPE contract. So let's um, take that to personnel committee once, kind of there's a path, but mm -hmm. the path that you've presented, I'm in support of. of. I um, also recognize that the restructure of the two staff roles also is part of the 49ers contract, which that contract is still yes. open. Um, so part of however that needs to be restructured so that that's appropriately reflected, I'm also in support of. Right. When we finalize that, I would like to see just total dollar impact. I yeah. suspect oh, absolutely. at some point. Let's, yeah, we, let's we just didn't want to go too much further without kind of introducing these concepts throughout the whole memo. We, we, we've done a little bit of work on all of these, but we want at least to say, okay, we don't see anything here that's, that's, that you should stop doing and not do. Uh, so if, unless I hear differently, we will continue through all of these to, to try to cement them down and, and have some proposals before you. Great. And so 
clarification, we are directionally um, kind of proving yes, continue on this path or giving some, seeing some nods at the table, um, but we will want to see full detail <coughs> of the financial impact of what that looks like. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and I would I would add if any if there's any additional clarity on kind of operations change or improvement with that kind of structural change or adjustment or modification that would really be helpful to me as well. So I don't know what off. that means in a practical sense. So <laughs> yeah. No, definitely I uh, I can kind of just in even the job description it kind of spell out a lot of stuff that wasn't in the previous one. You know. Kind of the job descriptions themselves are pretty muddy. I mean, just a vague boilerplate type of a job description where now it kind of spells out, you know, what your functions are, what over and above what a normal maintenance worker is. So it, it kind of spells it out and then gives them direction of their expectations of what, you know, what they're required to do above just normal day-to-day -day work. Okay. Great. Any other questions or comments from council on this one? And finally, strategic planning. We mentioned this at the, the first meeting of the year, um, and I indicated that we'd come back to the workshop and kind of get a better idea where and what scope you wanted to go down to. Uh, strategic plans can be very short. They can be long. They can include uh, just the council. They can include department heads and what they were looking for. So I, I, in order for us to begin and to, begin to uh, outline um, a, an RFP type for a for a moderator of of uh, the strategic plan. I'd like your thoughts now on how extensive it's going to be. Where do you want to see this going? What do you want in it? Uh, who do you want involved? I mean, they 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 come strategic plans are come in all shapes and forms and involve all kinds of people. So uh, you know, I have certain ideas what I think should happen, but I'd rather hear yours and so we don't miss those. On some notes here. Um, the last, and I'll start with a question. The last strategic plan that we did was it a five-year plan? Is that do, is that what we lined out or what previous council lined two out? Two-year. It was a two-year plan. Yep. So I guess one of the first questions, and Patrick, this is going to bounce right back to you or another staff. Um, what is a recommended timeline? Because obviously, if we're looking for something that is more robust, it's a in timeline, it's a more robust process. In Correct. your experience, five aim, years. Aim for five years. Absolutely. Um, similar to a capital improvement plan yeah. uh, that we 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 do, we should be doing or are doing. Uh, five years is a short enough time to to encapsulate you know where you want to go. It, it sets up your next five years work. Obviously, uh, any organization, particularly a public one like this, is dynamic and may change and may. Uh, send you down a different road, you know, two years later. Uh, but yeah, five year, five year goals and five years plan is is usually a, a, the norm that we we see. I think for me, you know, just kind of walking down a path of sort of clarifying or establishing the kind of the current state vision, mission, values, kind of core. Um, core values, mm -hmm. I guess, um, as a community uh, that we have. Um, considering some mechanism for community involvement, I know that we have some data, we've done some surveying and that kind of thing. Um, so just to maybe see where we're at with that base at baseline. Um, and then I think use, utilizing the 2040 comp plan as sort of the driver, um, kind of unpacking and repacking maybe. Um, it's a great document uh, mm -hmm. with a lot of really rich data. Um, maybe establishing out of that piece of the planning some three to five, three to five maybe really high level goals. Um, kind of those um, strategic objectives and then developing those strategic, strategic initiatives and timelines around that. Um, and just, you know, just some thoughts I had around kind of quality of life, growth, economic development, um, financial performance and use of resources, um, kind of our community and our customer, our assets and service delivery, so kind of our organizational performance. Um, 
And then our organizational capacity, do we have what we need to deliver? Uh, quality services, human capital, our technology, we're talking about some of that tonight. Mm -hmm. um, and then our internal culture, um, is our team really engaged and invested in the work that we're, that we're doing? So, um, and then alignment of that day-to-day -day work with strategy, we've talked about this before. Um, community council, city staff, our commissions, our EDA, we're all on the same path yep. at the end of this. So that's just my, kind of my thoughts and ideas. Um, and then of course, um, I'm a measurement girl, so some sort of system to measure our progress, kind of those benchmarks marks or targets and our key performance indicators and how do we know we're succeeding. Mm -hmm. So, um, and I think the last thing for me is that communication I've talked about, kind of that two-way communication um, out to our citizens and from our citizens back to us. What does that look like? So, other thoughts, questions? I have nothing to add to that. <laughs> I was up there. Com that was pretty thorough. <laughs> Comprehensive list. Um, I, I think. Um, a process that is that comprehensive, um, so I'm supportive of. I think we do need, a, want a facilitator to facilitate that. Um, I envision at least two sessions. So there is a initial session um, where we evaluate what's known on the table today, and we, but we're in that process, you're identifying all sorts of things we don't know. Um, and you give a break and give opportunity for that information to be gathered and some of the discussion at the first meeting is how are we gonna get at that information? It might be community conversations, might be town halls, might be some research that staff's assigned. We might mm -hmm. need some studies done, whatever. Um, so th that information is um, identified and then come back in a second session to kind of fill in the gaps. And then also people have had an opportunity to digest, refine, um, I, so I think it's at least a two-part process um, with some pretty um, kind of strings attached to the process. And so I, what I'm looking for in a facilitator is someone who's <coughs> done that um, and really interested in hearing the stories and the outcomes of um, ha coming out with a plan to Kat Kathy's point, how are we going to measure, you know, um, our, how we're progressing according to that plan. Um, and having as part of the whole process, council department heads and at least the chairs of our boards and commissions, um, that would be part of the initial core team and then I would expect as those plans are developed, each of the boards and commissions have many sessions to align with and mm -hmm. make decisions that they need to make at the individual board commission to be in, in alignment. Where, where do we see the role for some of our key stakeholders in the community? Our school superintendent, our, I, you know, that's, the, that's a little bit fuzzy to me where we might see them plug in, but I do think we need them involved in the process in some way, shape, or form. You know, our chamber ED, our uh, executive director, for example, and our school superintendent, and any other kind of key, key stakeholders <laughs> in the community that... Also, oh, that's part of um, part of that perhaps that step two of recognition of what don't we know and um, and opportunity for outreach between first meeting and second meeting um, to gather some of that information and input. Um, mm -hmm. Let's make it. I'm, I'm interested in advice of a good strategic planner is going to know who should be at the table and when. Um, because recognizing a room of 50 is not nearly as efficient as a room of 10 to 15, 20. Um, so let's, um, but you want to hear multiple yeah. voices. Right, and we'll, we'll depend on whoever the, the moderator is going to be to help guide us through some of that and, and, and talk to you about how big or how small or what the size of the plan is as well. So we don't, you know, just go crazy and get down to some minuscule that we're gonna use pink asphalt instead of black or something like that, so. Also a, um, a strong strategic planner is going to have great references and so mm -hmm. I would oh, yeah. look for um, references from um, cities that are of a similar size and complexity of Forest Lake, what's worked well for them. Um, what has worked for a very small community in northern Minnesota or in Minneapolis is probably not what's going to work for Forest Lake. So let's get something that somebody that yeah. fits us. Okay. Is that good for that's a next good start. Steps? It's a good start. It's a yes. long list, but it's a big list, and that's okay. 
And again, we will depend on the, the professional to, to guide us on how yeah. big or small this is going to be and what, yeah. what we can do and what we cannot cover. So, What was our timeline on that, Patrick? When did, we're, when did we say? I'm not sure. We, I mean, we talked about the first quarter. Um, you know, I, I would say that hopefully by engaging somebody, at least in the first quarter, and then figuring out a schedule after that, um, you know, May, June, July, something like that. I would hope we'd maybe get somebody in here and have a, a couple of Saturday workshops and, and go from there. Mm -hmm. Well, I think ideally it would be nice to have it done in time for budget. Yep, if we can, yeah, yes. absolutely. Yep. And we're started we're <coughs> after we've got our uh, fifth council member seated. Mm -hmm. um, Correct. So I'm kind of yep. pigeonholing between those two landmarks. Yep. Budget season tends to kick off soon after the 4th of July. Well, actually, department head budgets are typically have done by at least Maybe first draft, end of June. So um, we'll want to give you some time to react to that. And I think also a strategic planner will help guide some of the more immediate items rather than some of the things that can take a longer, we can take a longer view on. Okay, anything else, um, Patrick? No, I think that's it. Thank you. It's a great uh, overview, and it's great to hear your assessment of where we've been, so, kind of your assessment um, on board, and um, appreciate the appreciate the work. Okay, moving on to our next agenda item: ADA transition plan. And I'm looking down at Ryan. Ryan, I think you're going to walk us through between Ryan and Dave. Sure. I'll kick it off. Uh, Mayor City Council, in your packet is a draft Americans with Disability Act self-evaluation and transition plan for public right-of-ways. Uh, just kind of back up, why are we here with this uh, draft plan? Um, basically in 1990 with the enactment of the Americans with Disability Act, basically kind of outlines with what we've already been really practicing, never really in paper. Uh, not a lot of communities have an adopted plan, uh, you know, prior to what was additional teeth, I guess, put into the requirement, where MnDOT and FHWA were basically then came to a point in 2016 that's because of the lack of compliance, you know, throughout the area that uh, we're going to require this to be a completed or adopted plan or a plan that's um, well on the way to being completed and adopted. Otherwise, you're not going to be continuing to receive federal money for projects that we've had in the past in the 2019-22 uh, TIP, which is the Transportation Improvement Program or the other programs you know, related to that. We do have a project in 2020 that has that federal funding tied to it. So, you know, MnDOT specifically asking us about that, so, you know, where we're at. So we've been in coordination with them for a couple of years now, just kind of not moved dramatically fast on this and adopt it in case there were any changes or events but really at the point it's now to go through the formal adoption process but before we get to that point part of the criteria requirements of the plan are to have some public component to it and so tonight you know here you can see even on the draft this draft was printed in October you know we kind of waited I guess you know obviously to bring a new council on board too to carry through this public component of it um, we're not really put in any new financial requirements onto the city is basically written and concluded into a, a policy of what we're practicing now just having it on paper and then uh, <clears throat> moving forward but so what would come about this is what we would propose to do in the future is hold a public uh, open house here at City Hall just like we would do if it was a major street project and give the opportunity to the public to come in and comment on, on the uh, draft plan uh, we could also engage specific elderly groups, whether it would be held at the YMCA or the Senior Citizen Center, uh, to get some feedback that way. And then also at the end, depending on how big of a public outreach you would desire, we would eventually have to have a public hearing here at uh, City Council meeting prior to formally adopting the plan. Um, so what you see within it, uh, general outline basically is our strategy into uh, removing these barriers within public right away that prohibit ADA compliance is, you know, as our street projects move forward through the neighborhoods, that's when we would be addressing the stuff. 
and or through uh, private developments and or through cooperative agreement projects and just you know routine maintenance that public works would be uh, completing that's been outlined such as you know like if a sidewalk heaves right you got two edges up in the air you know, come through and groove that back down so the maintenance plus the improvements are outlined in here we have a thick set of standards engineering standards and guidelines that we've already formally adopted that we follow but you know that then outlines all that stuff within here too so Basically, it's just a formal document formalizing everything that we already do within ADA compliance as we take those very seriously. And even projects that have even received state or federal or grant funding, they always go through an ADA compliant review within the agency supplying the money. So, so it would be nothing new or outside the boundaries of what we have to deal with to get project approvals, um, but just more else go through, get a formal adopted plan. But like I said before that, we would go through a public outreach. Uh, We'd like to complete that for sure over the next six months, uh, uh, just because with the project in 20, you know, obviously we, we believe we met those thresholds and that wouldn't jeopardize anything. But if the event we are applying for additional grants uh, that have f federal money tied to it, we feel this obviously will be a deciding factor among some of our communities or it'll be a proponent within our grant applications that say we've already completed and adopted it. Why maybe we're competing in somebody that hasn't. So. Just trying to be on the front edge of requirements instead of behind and begging for forgiveness, I guess. So tonight's more of an informational meeting, unless there's specific things you guys see within the plan that don't address something that you felt that should have been addressed and or uh, if you have any preference on the public engagement. Otherwise, we would probably schedule and set forth some of those meetings at a staff level uh, and moving forward over the next six months before we finally adopt it at a city council meeting and a public hearing. Questions for Ryan on ADA compliance plan? Just a comment. That's, yeah, I was going to say, um, when do, well, actually a question and a comment, sorry. Mm -hmm. um, public open house houses, when do we typically have those? I mean, do we, are they in the evening? Are they during the day? I'm just thinking of public engagement just in general. Like, are people able to even attend those? Typically, we hold them in the evening, 4 o'clock or later, mm -hmm. and allow a few hours. Uh, sometimes we've had people show up for stuff, and sometimes we have, right. you know, sometimes we're, the room's overwhelmed, depending on what the topic is, and sometimes we might have one or two people pop up. Sure, yeah. That's why you mentioned going going to the Y and going yeah. to the senior, which I, I like that idea. I like going to them and not always making people come to us. We would also put it on the city's website. I didn't mention mm -hmm. that, but to have the social media mm -hmm. side of it as well. We are able to do an off-site, though, that doesn't require the city hall. Are we able to as as do something at the senior center or do something at the well, YMCA? Would be, uh, I would, if you're going to have a public meeting or want a public meeting, I'd have one here at city hall. Mm -hmm. And typically it's good to have that prior to something. Uh, maybe it's, a, you know, we would do it at 5 o'clock to 6.30 before a future workshop. Mm -hmm. That way there's already something going on, so maybe some people are coming anyways for a meeting and you get some of that traffic, but uh, the senior citizen stuff or the YMCA, that would be a separate reach out. Separate. Hey, what would work good? What, when are the facilities yep. available? When would you, you know, can you ask your crowd that might be engaged in it that would work best for them? And we could do that during the day or at night. What, I mean, whatever is convenient, so. 9 a.m. pickleball at the YMCA is a pretty popular time. <laughs> Just throwing that out there. Um, so we can be flexible on that and have yep. certainly a, a public meeting, but then a couple of outreach items as well. Okay. Do do we still have the circulator running through with the seniors? Because that the 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 morning component of that is individuals with disabilities, correct? Getting them to work. There isn't a work component. Getting them well, the the, but isn't there isn't that isn't that twofold like it is in White Bear, because there's an there's an earlier route circulator route, where it's it's work related and then there's that gap. Dan Dan shaking his head. We just get in. the we just have the senior component here. We, we do. don't have okay. the disability okay. component out here. We 
just have the scenic component. Okay, because I was just going to suggest that would be an audience to tap into. So, although given just those stops, given here, those so. stops, having a meeting at City Hall that is in, you know, related to those stops, because that is going from Cherrywood Point, it's going from the YMCA, and has an opportunity to potentially Good idea. be a transportation option. That actually, there's a they have a I believe a new meeting every Wednesday at the Senior Center where that bus is a component of getting everybody to that luncheon that they have every week so that would be a good fit just to have it during a regular scheduled every Wednesday lunch that they have at the senior center. I'm just trying to figure out a way to yep. reach kind of the younger population too you know so um, I, I think we need to kind of explore where where that could possibly happen kind of engaging uh, younger folks with disabilities as well. Makes I wonder if that's where reaching out to um, Dr. Massey in the schools, the, the different, the charter and the public, um, or Fourth Lake District. Mm -hmm. And they have the 18 to 21 program mm -hmm. up on the, off of Broadway there too. So, good ideas. Any other questions, comments for Ryan? Point of clarification, whenever we're talking about ADA compliance plan, we're talking about the use of only public infrastructure, correct? Um, so public everything infrastructure and public right away. In public right away. So anything that is um, ADA compliance related to private business for purposes of this discussion is out of scope. Just wanted that clarification made. Um, we're only talking about infrastructure and right away that is public. Um, I don't have anything else. Ryan, do you have what you need? I believe so. Okay. Uh, if something certainly comes up between now and you know next time. Feel free to just reach out with any questions or concerns. You said within six months. Um, is there any reason why we couldn't put together a work plan that starts this going sooner rather than later? I, what I don't want us to do is to get in. We are a heavy, this is important because we are a heavy utilizer for a number of reasons, one of which is we're a heavy utilizer of grants, and I would hate for us to not have something done. We'll go faster. Okay. Thank you. Next item, Patrick, we do have a strategic planning report on combined, we covered, let's call it done. Um, next item is council appointment interview questions. Skip six. Number I six. skipped something Number again. Six. Number, six. Number six, privately designed public infrastructure. I knew I was gonna do it. And I believe Ryan and Dave, are you gonna walk us through this one? Donovan, I am missing it entirely. Let's not all talk at once here. Um, this is largely a you know engineering focused uh, item discussion item. However, the actual vehicle to accomplish it, if it's the council's will, is through a zoning code amendment. Um, you know, Ryan did did lead, uh, provide you with a list of advantages and disadvantages of uh, changing. <clears throat> The, uh, the current system, which allows for the private developer to design the public infrastructure um, back to the system in which uh, they currently had uh, prior to 2016 or 2015, um, and uh, in which the C engineer does design public infrastructure. So everything within the right of way is designed by the uh, CN engineer who knows city standards, um, and then um, based then, but the developer pays for it, as they do now, and it's publicly de publicly dedicated. Um, the also in your packet is the uh, potential of the vehicle to do it through the, the zoning code text amendment. Um, and this was just a quick draft. This, you know, if this is a direction we want to take um, and work with Bridget on finalizing that and then taking it through the public process uh, through a plan commission recommendation and. Um, city Council decision. At uh, this point, I'd like for uh, Ryan to perhaps kind of flesh out some of the advantages and disadvantages of this. Thank you. Sorry for skipping over you. So I guess a little more history, kind of why we're why we're here again tonight, just for your guys' background. Uh, before some year before 2000, the city you know allowed private. Uh, development or public infrastructure to be designed by private engineering. Obviously, when the city started seeing the growth that it did, and probably things, you know, I don't know, I'm just speculating, but things just weren't going the way that 
the city or township envisioned. Then somewhere around 2000, it was switched back that the, at the time, you know, you were still separated. You had the township in the city, but each of their engineers were preparing the plans if it was for public infrastructure, such as you take a subdivision, you know, he comes in. Obviously, they're still in charge of the grading and maximizing all the lots they can to get, you know, the benefit of the property. But so when it came to the physical public infrastructure inside the right of way, there were a lot of issues that led, then led to the city engineer or the township engineer designing those plans uh, from 2000 to 2014. So the last project that was done that way was Headwater 7th, which basically extended trunk line sewer and water over to where the Leela High School is today and brought the, the roads right up to that. And then there was some pressure from a developer who wanted to use their own. Uh, and then that's when the ordinance changed in 15 and that first project you know was here so i just i just brought the stuff so if you wanted to see what really the ping pong game that goes back and forth you know this is just some of the the printouts of the review memos um and they were given i mean we give out we gave out the headwater seventh plan so we weren't trying to hide anything or didn't want anybody to fail because you know at the end of the day we're all gonna be be there together and own the infrastructure but it's just, you know, some developments have gone okay, right? And some just haven't. And, you know, on the private side, you know, when they're doing private work, they're used to doing private work. Here's my flat fee, here's what you're going to get, and here's what I've done in other communities. And uh, when we're missing things on plans or don't have things, you know, the right hydrant specs, then our fire department loses out because they can't hook up to it. Or if they're the wrong rings on castings and stuff like that, then Public Works is now dealing with something different. Or just the efficiency that we go back and forth and review comments instead of actually just put it into a plan. Uh, because you, I'll just pass this along so you guys can see this and keep it. So that's just phase one of, say, Chestnut Creek, right? Uh, not only do we have extensive long review memos of all the things that were missed or not taken account for, but then we go through all their plant sets and redline them too, but then we just came back and forth. So the efficiency there on getting to what the developer wants at the end of the day is an approved plan, takes a lot longer. Um, and then when it's coming to the, to the management side of the projects, you know, prior to, you know, 14 here, where we would coordinate and deal with everything on the site, including the private utilities, you still got development work in Chestnut Creek phase one that was constructed in, 2016 that still has light poles in the middle of where sidewalks supposed to go so you got start and stops of sidewalks that's been sitting now this will be three years we still don't have a turn lane completed uh, well now the turn lane potentially will get completed this summer but you got tons of landscaping that needs to be moved because it, again you had somebody coordinating the project that wasn't on site local and uh, what we've been dealing with the examples you're giving right now are those chestnut creek yep. yeah uh, and I think really with a conversation, you know what, we were going to support it anyway, because yeah. what you guys want, we'll make sure you get, uh, but you've also drained a lot of staff time from your other departments, uh, being involved in other projects, and I think in the example of, for that, that conversation is obviously Second Avenue. I mean, how much time has Dan Undum, Donovan, Dave spent on that, and we're Council. now not completed with that project, and we'll go into a third year construction there as well where if that was a public project, we would have had that built in the summer. So that, that's what we've been dealing with. Uh, we've laid out, you know, what my opinion is some advantages and disadvantages of what that would entail of the public-private uh, infrastructure. Uh, we did it for 14 years. Things went well. Um, but, you know, one pressure, one developer, that's wanted the change and thus the zoning text amendments and then you know all the staff time that's been consumed and you know it's things that we're waiting on so you know another example of a subdivision here is the work was built and we didn't get record plans until I would say middle of 18 so we had two years of people living out there where public works is now in charge of water and sewer, but we don't know where anything is because the record plans aren't done in our hands yet. So uh, before that, you know, once the utilities were built that <coughs> year, regardless, those record plans got done that winter and were already turned over to the 
to the city before you know March April. So, so just efficiencies on some of that stuff. Um, but <coughs> again, just making and ensuring that the city's getting their infrastructure built according to their specifications and requirements, uh, and not taking any shortcuts on that stuff. So. That's kind of, I guess, why we're here in the conversation. If any staff has anything additional to say, I would speak now. But I can add something. I, just from the public works perspective, and Ryan hit on a couple of the points, but uh, it, Ryan and I have worked, you know, for a number of years now together, and he knows what I like to see in developments, and he knows that I know that he knows that we like to see we have an inspector now that knows his level of expectation and mine and if we were to bring it back in house it would just go so much smoother you know from the design to what he expects his inspector to have for myself that it's i won't have to spend so much time checking up or reviewing plans you know it's they know what hydrants we put in what gate valves what riser rings you know what what all those specs are and They'll send a you know a private. They'll send us a sheet like that, and it's reviewing every single one to make sure everything's exactly correct. Whereas, if you know Ryan and Bolton Mink were to do it, you would know everything on our side. The infrastructure would be you know up to my expectations, and then to follow with that with the inspector that knows what my expectations of quality are too. It just makes it ten times ten times easier. And you know his point too with the city approved contractor. I don't know how many issues we've run in in those two developments that he has brought up that, you know, if you had a, the correct contractor in there, things would even, I mean, just having the right contractor and they're not the lowest bid, you know, it, it makes stuff so much smoother. And um, to this point, you know, the time Donovan spends and the time I spend and the time well, Dan's not here, I can't imagine how many hours he just spent on Second Avenue. I mean, in the last year, it's just <coughs> insane. And, mm -hmm. We had to wait on Second Avenue. If we would have, we had to wait to shut the water plant down in October. We would have probably had it paved that that fall, and then the wear on in the spring of was that 17 now or 18. It would have been done, or you know, done in, spring uh, of 18. 18. You know, now it's still a gravel road. It's just just those little things that are just frustrating and just snowballs into more time. And you know, like Mara said too, it's the time council spent on it too. And mm -hmm. I think if you can line everything up, all back up together, just way more efficient, and you know, you're going to get a better finished product as well. You know, for longer lasting. Where do we where do we fall um, around surrounding communities or benchmark communities on allowance of? Um, are we an outlier? Where where do other cities fall on this particular topic? Woodbury, Cottage Grove. I believe Apple Valley, uh, Maple Grove for sure, Chaska, all do it by their city staff or consult. But like a, um, some of our more immediate Hugo, Columbus, Wyoming. I don't know if Hugo has much development other than commercial. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Hugo, my understanding is they do it how we're doing it right now. So. That's kind of where your, you know, your development is us and south of here that's consistent when you're seeing subdivisions annually. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Or plats, right. I guess. The challenge for me on this one is I can appreciate that it's, so I'm interested in hearing some developer perspectives on this um, on both sides. Um, I appreciate that there's a perspective that is potentially cheaper. Um, and I think we need to hold that in balance, but the, part where I really get um, wrapped around the axle quickly is residents expect this to be our us. And so when something goes wrong, you know, the, the calls come and it's not, there's nothing more frustrating than to have that be outside of our control because there's certainly the resident expectation that the buck stops with us. As it does, it's just there's times in that project when we don't have that control and um, that's been a frustrating experience. So. Um, is there a is there a middle ground where the pendulum doesn't swing all of the way? Is there a 
I, I feel like there's been times when it's worked well one way, but then we've switched and now we switch back. And is that just, is it a binary option or is there something in the middle? I'm just So the developer would still be required to do its grading plan, right? Which sets all the grades for everything. Mm -hmm. We basically come, come in and fit the street and utilities inside that, right? And then prepare the plans and specs for that. And then prepare the bidding documents that would be bidded privately mm -hmm. with the developer, working with the developer, and you don't go through the public bid process, you would open the bids then, and he could then pick if, oh, that guy's close enough, but I'd rather work with that guy. Right. So then, but that then came off an approved contractor's list that the city had, and then the developer could add to that if he wanted to, you know, every once in a while they'd have another name and go, no, nope, those are the big boys that I want. So anyway, so we'll go with that. And then uh, we would do like we do on uh, pay, pay apps, but we would prepare a pay request just like what you guys see in, you know, your agenda items. And then right then and there, you know, that goes to the developer to pay his, to his guys, but then we also know that that's the letter of credit right there. So all that work's done in one. It's a, you know, a separate request, then we go through and see what's done or not. Somebody's already tracked that because we were in charge of the quantities in the field too. So, uh, you know, basically everything outside of the right of way, the developer's still responsible for. So right. the survey of the lots and stuff like that and certification of his subcut of his road prior to a utility contractor coming on board because if it's two feet off, then you're gonna deal with a claim from the contractor anyway. So they, they you know, certify the center line just like they always do and then hand it off to the, the how it came. That's kind of where, how it, my understanding of other communities that do it that way, and then well, that's what we was practiced for 14 years you know, before. So. I, guess, I guess you can look at it, you know, I think there's some developers, we've dealt with some recently that, are, that do a really good job, and then you run into ones that do horrible, I suppose, maybe it comes down to which way you want to err. Do you want to not risk having any more bad jobs and just getting a project in and out and infrastructure in and done with and not have to risk that or look the other way and cross your fingers every time somebody comes in with a development and you know hope they pick somebody good and it gets done correctly. I believe even um, with the, the best engineers, there are some specialties that Bolton Mink does for instance, the lift station design, where they know what they want, they know what works in the city, and even though the engineer, like the, I'm thinking of the, probably the, the best one whose plans I see, where it came to a lift station design, it was a lot of back and forth. And so it's just, this, this is, it's just the city is the expert at their own infrastructure, essentially. Our topography, our, what works with our history. Yeah. Right, and anything from soil conditions uh, to like, other, you know how it fits into the, the into the system. Has, this is a more um, nitty nit question. Has has Bridget reviewed the proposed language of the changes yet, or is that kind of next step? No, I was waiting for our, our, you know the results of this okay. this workshop discussion. Um, but essentially, you know what I outlined in, in this text here is, you know it's pretty much re replacing license engineer with seat engineer removing um, some of the safeguards involving licensing for the engineer and you know insurance requirements, that sort of thing. And then um, also taking out, the, there was an option to allow for alternate, you know, the, where the developer could choose the, the public engineer to design the public infrastructure. Um, so it's, it's, more, it's, it's easier to undo it than it was to do it. There it was, it, it was a lot of conversation around how to implement this, and actually d did include some good language around just you know defining what public infrastructure is. Mm -hmm. So I mean I think there was some benefit to that change that we will still retain if we do change do, do choose to switch back to the public design of the infrastructure. Okay. The um, has staff reached out to developers where there has been a good working relationship to seek some opinion thoughts. Um, is there a, is, do we have a, have we had any of that, have we formally seek, sought any of that opinion? No, I, I can do that though. I mean, definitely, you know, there's people I can call to kind of 
do some informal polling on you know what they would you know what they believe if that would be a change that would could benefit them or if they have any constructive you know feedback. Did I hear this was going to be vetted with the planning commission as well? Yeah, part of the, uh, the zoning text process for the city is it goes before the they, they hold a public hearing with the with the uh, with the planning commission. They consider it and they make a recommendation. Okay. And that rec then it goes to council. And they can say, you know, recommend approval or denial, but it's a recommendation. But then it goes to, to uh, council and that's and council makes the final decision. Okay. So it sounds like there's some opportunity for other eyes to take mm -hmm. a look at this. Yeah, you always want that. Mm -hmm. Other questions or comments? Questions of staff? All right, Donovan, do you have what you need for next steps on this one? Um, I'd like to, uh, um, you know, do some do some informal discussion with with developers, um, and then bring it before Bridget. Um, ask for you know write up an you know official some ordinance language and advertise for the public hearing and bring it um, before the planning commission in February. I think whatever we can do to prevent the next Second Avenue, I think that's just been yes. the poster child of what has gone wrong. And um, that was going to be my question: was that the poster child yeah. um, right. or a poster child? Right. So we're still fielding questions and concerns on that, and we will up and right up until spring and until it's paved. So, mm -hmm. okay. All right, if I can keep my numbers straight. Next item: item eight, council appointment interview questions. Yeah, we just um, brought the, from the last time you did uh, the process to fill a seat, uh, we brought forward those questions for you to review and just would like to know if those are sufficient or if you have suggestions to add, subtract, or take a different course on how you want this to be. I mean, obviously you can add and subtract up to you. It's really your process and and you decide, so... I'll add just a slight bit of color onto that. Um, when council designed these questions last time, um, we didn't have any idea of how many applicants we were going to have. Um, I'll remind council last time we did end up with 13 applicants and I thought for sure we're not gonna have 13 interviewees and we sure did, we had 13 interviewees. So um, can't predict what's going to happen this go round, but know that the intent is that every, and we can, talk about whether this is appropriate or not, but the last time the intent was that every applicant had got asked the same questions. Um, and since we had that process, we wanted a shorter list rather than a longer list, recognizing, mm -hmm. you know, five questions times 20 applicants could be a really long Yeah, list. I strongly recommend that you use the same questions for every applicant. Now, follow-up questions that you have by based on what a response is is entirely different, but keep, in that way, keep it even, keep it fair. And Nobody feels like you're slanting your judgment anyway. No, I, I certainly agree with that. Keep everything on a level, level playing field. Can you refresh me what we ask in the application? Mm. We miss Relative to the... Great question. These are the questions, well, the interview questions, questions I mean, right? Yeah, well, probably so what foundational and, yeah. information will we have? Can we limit it here? While Patrick is pulling that up, um, great question. Any other questions or thoughts related to interview questions in particular? Was there a, just a time frame? I can't remember, and, and I did this process, but <laughs> was there a time frame for each candidate? As far as? Just um, like a time, like five minutes to, to get up and, and speak. I don't, I can't I don't remember. think there was any formally. I think it just depended on how many questions were back and forth. Yeah. Okay. That's really what I wanted to That's All right, that's what I thought. Uh, some had a little bit longer uh, bios, that kind of thing, you know? Okay. So I don't think we had a specific time, though. No time, okay. I don't think we specifically gave time frames per candidate, and I think the group was kind enough to self-regulate given the number of people on the list. Um, but Pat, while Patrick's pulling that up, um, a couple of other items um, that relate to this, um, there is some, um, there's an interpretation from our city attorney on data that is public. 
um, and some interpretation around um, what available what information on those applicants is available to everybody, um, the public versus what's available to council. And so what has been proposed for this process is very similar to what we did last time when we had this process, which is the publicly available information is incredibly high level and redacted from personal identifiable information. So essentially the public will see um, not much more than a name and a, a quick um, biography of maybe education background. Council will be provided as um, the full applications, the unredacted versions, um, and that is related to rules around data privacy and employment law, and there's some interpretations out there around how that data has to be treated. So just setting expectations. Um, public will see a list of names and a very high-level summary, and then council will have the full information <coughs> available to them privately. But then, the but then once they're selected, then it, everything becomes public. And then whoever yeah. is selected, they are then a public official. And because they are a public official, everything on that application is then available. Um. Yes, uh, the application beyond the name and address, phone number, et cetera, asks how long have you lived in Forest Lake? Uh, list community and or volunteer activities that you've been involved with within the community, uh, the Forest Lake community. Uh, describe any previous experience which you have similar to serving on the city council. Mm -hmm. Describe any scheduling conflicts you may have with regular monthly, bi-monthly meetings. Um, explain why you are interested in serving on the city council. And detail any information you'd like the city of Forest Lake to know when reviewing your application. And then it asks to complete a candidate filing statement which, bases, which says provide a filing statement on why you would be a suitable candidate to serve as a member of the Forest Lake City Council, mm -hmm. and if you, you, those are on those are online, if you want to review those, you can pull those up and look. Okay. And what's the deadline? Deadline is the end of the business day or four thirty on February first. Okay. Do we have a sense of the number of applicants? I have not asked yet. Okay. So. Okay. As of this morning, there was one application that was had been received. Okay. Which. So let's finalize questions and then I have one more question of council related to this process. Any modifications to the interview questions or any feedback to staff? Um, one question that was asked of me that I wanted to talk about tonight, um, does council have a preference around receiving those application packets? Do you wanna receive them as they come in or would you rather receive them all in mass on af after the filing close? I think I just, me personally, I just didn't have a packet of all of them at one time. That's a just whole me. Whole that's packet just me. at once? Whole packet. Whole packet at once? Yeah. Okay. That's just me. I'm, I'm the only dissenter, but I can go with the flow. <laughs> that'll get, that'll yeah. get full packet yeah. after close of business on the sure. first. Yeah. Very that's, good. That's fine. The publicly available information will be posted to our site. Nothing has been posted yet, but will be posted to our site as those applications come in. And I imagine staff will do that tomorrow. We'll get those that have come in so far. Um, posted and so, but that is at that very high level information. Um, council received full packets then after close of business on February 1st. All right. Any, anything before I close out that I hope? So we don't need to make a firm decision on these tonight? You can't. We, well, I mean, we're, we're just saying. Staff's we're just looking for guidance on Staff's looking for guidance on any changes to the interview questions. Okay. It isn't something we vote on, Kathy. That's what I meant. No, no, no. Yeah. I know. Yeah, I, I, re, I realize that. But, okay. I mean, I'm just wondering if is if we leave here tonight, is this a done deal? I mean, or do we have another opportunity to kind of wait? No, I, I think you should have an opportunity to review the questions. I mean, it's just okay. here's what we're thinking. Here's what you did the last time. If there's something else that you want, yep. even up to the night before the interview, you over the night, the day of the interview, you can still change your questions okay. if you all agree that that's what you're going to do. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, and if I had done my homework and looked at that application before I came in, I might have some additional okay. feedback, but now I want to put it on hold. Okay. So. Okay. okay. Um, we are now to the other section of the agenda. I'll ask staff first anything on the staff perspective from other topics. Yeah, I have something. Um, this is within the strategic uh, planning realm. 
Um, it's actually a building capacity workshop that is offered. It's free. Um, it's given by the Urban Land Institute, um, which is a national organization that promotes uh, leadership for thriving communities, sustainable communities. Um, and they have a Navigating Your, Your Competitive Future workshop that's given to um, cities, municipalities, um, uh, to develop, you know, policy and kind of greater understanding of how their own community fits in with the, the regional market and, the regional and also, also offers insights on development trends. It's a two-hour um, workshop and it is a fact-based, nonpartisan examination of real estate and development market challenges tailored to fit each city. Um, many communities throughout the metro have done it. Hugo has done it, for instance. Um, and uh, with um, council's blessing, I could, you know, talk to the, the to the staff member who scheduled these, and you know, find find some potential times um, when we could do that. And I'm thinking it would be maybe ideally a Thursday night, um, Thursday evening activity. It's two hours. It's free, um, and you know, potentially also invite the EDA to also participate. Um, Again, because it is, it's. I think they they're a great organization. If you're not familiar um, with them, and they really do, you know, pr provide like levels of expertise that are. I mean, their 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 mission is to provide that to pr provide that leadership to communities. Um, and uh, so, I recommend um, council uh, partaking in this. But you know, but I need your consent that you're you're on board. can't think of a reason why we wouldn't take up that op that opportunity. Mm -hmm. um, so your recommendation for attendees would be um, staff, council, and EDA, is that? Yes. Right. Yeah. Any? Decision makers is, is what, who's it's geared right. toward. Right. Yeah. Um, I would be supportive of taking a couple hours on a Thursday. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. If you want to work on kind of some potential schedules and yeah, the, it probably just realistically. They, yeah, I got a November. I got an no, um, email in November from the scheduler, so the, it's you know potentially it'd be you know a few months before we kind of could fit ourselves in their, into their schedule. Right. So it's not an immediate thing, but I think it'd be really worthwhile. Right. Sounds good. Thanks. I'd welcome that joint workshop with uh, <laughs> the EDA. Good. Anything else from staff on other agenda items? Council, anything on the other agenda items? I didn't have anything, no. Well, I just wanted to mention that the um, Hoops Club's having their big ball tournament this weekend, mm -hmm. um, and Council, I know, all received an invite. They have 174 teams and 4,000 people expected um, and are really uh, doing a great job um, c kind of um, engaging the business community. Um, bringing them on board uh, to do some of their catering and those sorts of things. And um, it's 8 a.m. to 7 p.m. Uh, Saturday and Sunday. So I would just say if anybody is interested in going, go. Nice okay. nice community. I did uh, get that email also. Yeah. And I'm sure everybody did. Uh, mm -hmm. Be good. I think two things going on this weekend. Yeah. It just isn't going to yeah. work for me. So. Yeah. Well, it's a nice influx of uh, people into the community. Yep, so. for sure. Yep. Really nice job of inviting the businesses. Yep. Call it mini taste of Forest Lake. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anything else? I have anything? I have a couple, um, two quick items. Um, one, just a quick note, uh, reminder to uh, council that the January 28th um, EDA session is going to be a joint workshop with council and EDA. So I hope you all are able to attend that 530 uh, workshop format. We are expecting the um, HUL project to be presented. It's a great opportunity to learn some more information about that project and to start conversations. Um, and then the other quick follow-up item, I wasn't going to mention this tonight, but I will because it's kind of picked up some legs faster than I expected. Um, Councilmember Bystrom and I had a meeting yesterday evening with a concerned resident group just wanting to talk about, and they were looking for an update on where we are with um, Good View in 97. So it's kind of a good opportunity to talk about where we are related to um, the proposed project with uh, MnDOT, the timing for that project, as well as what the pedestrian facility options have been and kind of 
just opportunity to level set with them on with the safe routes for schools grant being denied kind of we're a little bit back to the starting point um, they went back as citizen groups are so um, good at doing and kicked off their own network I did get a call from representative Detmer this evening he and I were not able to connect personally but I appreciated his callback um, and I think it, it will be on a future work plan for us to have some conversations around what's next and um, getting new council up to speed on um, where we are with that project and what some of the options are um, so we can kind of road map that in. But there's a resident group that's interested and um, is doing their job as a concerned resident group, so it's good to see. And that's all I have. There's nothing else. I will look for a motion to adjourn. Go ahead. So moved. <laughs> Second. <laughs> and we're adjourned.